Welcome to breadboarding. This is part three of video 13 in the breadboard video controller series where we're extending the video card to do 256 color graphics and that can be chosen from a palette of 262,000 colors. So this is step seven and eight of the plan that we've been working to over the last series of videos. And in the previous videos, what we've done is added in the multiplexers to allow us to switch between the various character and graphics modes programmatically. And in the last video, we were able to switch between character mode and the high res two color mode. And we showed running the Tetris game and the Lunar Lander game. What we're going to do now is add the video DAC digital analog converter, and we need to hook it into the data bus and sort out how to do the chip enable read enable and write enable signals and then a little bit later we'll be then building out the other color multiplex for another latches and chips that we need to complete the high color graphics mode so this is a diagram I showed last time so you've done the multiplexes and page registers we'll be adding the latches soon and what we're going to be doing first of all is just making sure that we can get the video DAC to work with the existing character based mode first of all before we actually wire in all the 256 color graphics support. What we need to do then is to also build in a constant current source for the digital analog converter so it needs a constant current source to be able to generate the output voltages for VGA. VGA uses a 0.7 volt peak output voltage so that's what we need to work to. So if we have a look at the data sheet for the video DAC. So this is uh, Inmos IMS G176. The particular ones I've got are capable of going at uh, 40 megahertz, I think. So that should be capable of doing Super VGA. And the key thing we need to worry about here is that this particular chip is more aligned to the Intel bus signals rather than the Motorola 6809. So we have a, a write enable and a read enable here that combines both the chip select the E clock signal and the read write signal. So we're going to need to construct these to be able to interface with this particular chip. And it makes use of the A0 and A1 address lines and the CPU data bus. Now, there's quite a lot of information in here and need to say we don't need to go for all that at the moment. But I will just show you is a couple of the key things we need to worry about. The current reference needs to be calculated in the following way. So the, the current reference that we need is going to be based on the 0.7 volts. So we've got 0.7 volts divided by 2.058. And then the effective resistive load is in fact 75 ohms and 75 ohms in parallel. So that will actually be 37.5 ohms. So we divide by 37.5 ohms. And we'll see why that is in a minute in the video output section. So that's about nine, just over nine milliamps, the current source that we need to be able to get voltage levels going from zero to 0.7 volts. And we can also see down here that the microprocessor interface has four addresses. So in order to write to the three color values to a particular palette address, we need to write the address to 00, zero first, and then we do three subsequent writes of the red, green, blue color value to the 0, 01 address. If we are looking to read the current palette values for a current address, we again write the address using the address 11 there, and then three subsequent reads will then read the red, green, blue values from that. So this is the interface that we need to use for accessing the color palette information in here. And then a little bit further down, we've also then got the information about the output impedance and uh, impedance matching. So there's a general section here about line driving and, and feeding video output. So I won't go into that here, but the key thing here really is that this double termination mode is what we'll be using. So VGA monitors by default have a 75 ohm input impedance as we found in the earlier videos. And so what we're going to be doing here is putting a 75 ohm output impedance on this side. And this is where we get our 275 ohms in parallel gives us 37.5 ohms, which is where we put in that figure for the calculation for the current source. And further down here, there's actually some sample layouts on how to do the current source. And you can see here, there is a 
chip, the LM334, which is a constant current chip. And with 150 ohm and 15 ohm uh, resistors then, then that will give us uh, pretty close to our 9 milliamp current source that we need. So if you have a quick look at the LM334, um, you can see here that the current that we want is approximated by this formula here. So if you actually just check the resistor value that we've got there. So if we go back to our current that we identified here, if we divide that by 0.134 that will give us the inverse of, of what we want so if we do that we can see that that's about 14.7 ohms so um, that's close enough to 15 ohms so if we use the 15 ohms that should give us the current that we need so we just need to take another look at the read write signals so the diagram I've got here comes from the CPU data sheet and it just shows that the E clock signal which is used by the Motorola 6800 series CPUs that the end of cycle where the data is read or latched is on the high to low transition for E. When comparing this with the data sheet what I worked out is that we need to combine the read write signal the CRTC Y3 signal, and we'll, we'll look at where that comes from in a minute, and that's effectively the address enable signal for this particular video DAC, and then to generate the write and the read signals here. So this is output from the Kingster signal analyzer, and this just sort of shows the relationship between these sort of signals. So we need to combine the E signal, the read write signal and the chip enable signal to generate our read and write enable signals. So in my part three plan here, um, you can see here that um, the current source target is about uh, uh, nine milliamps, I think 8.89 .8, milliamps. I think somewhere in the data sheet it does say that 8.8 .8 milliamps. We need to find the chip enable for our video DAC. So we're going to be using the Y3 signal off one of the, the uh, CRTC decoder that we were using last time. And if we have a look at the NanoComp PLD that does the address decoding, we can see that the Y3 signal that we use for the CRTC, which starts at D400, if we look at the Y3 signal, then that is D580. So we're going to be able to talk to our video DAC starting at D580. So that's the, the line that we're going to be using for this. And we also then need to have a look at how to generate these read and write signals. So in the plan, what I've done is I worked out for the read, write, the E and the inverted E signal, what the various signals are, and basically worked it out on the basis of these two formula. And these formula are then plugged into my program or logic device configuration. This configuration isn't quite finished yet. We're going to have to add some extra signals for the various latch enables and things. But for the moment, this is making use of the outputs for the write enable and the read enable. And the inputs we're using for this are going to be the E signal, the read write signal, and the CRTC Y3. And then just down here, we can see that the read signal is based on that formula and the write signal is based on that formula. So I've already programmed one of those PLDs. It's obviously going to need further work to do all the latch enable signals, but we'll worry about that um, a little bit later on. And so what I'm going to do now is to look at the initial prototype board that I've done with the video DAC and I'll just uh, point you through that and then we'll run it up and check to see that we can actually get the, the video signals out of there appropriately. OK, so here's the uh, prototype video DAC board. So what we have here is the PLD and this is uh, a lot of the wires in here are wired into my logic analyzer that I've been using to develop this as we go along. So this PLD basically has inputs for the E signal from the system bus over there, the read write signal. And also then there is a wire coming from the Y3 outputs of one of the address decoders for the CRTC phase of the process. So those are the three input signals. And then basically the read and write signals are going out into the chip here. So if I zoom in here, we should be able to see this a little bit better. Now, um, over here, it's a little messy. I haven't tidied this up, but this is the constant current source. I will put this into KiCad and it will make it a little bit easier. But basically there's this 
the LM334 chip, two resistors, the 150 and the 15 ohm. I think this is 150, this is 15, and there's a diode. The diode helps to temperature compensate, so basically the current source won't drift when it gets hot and cold. Uh, we've got quite a bit of decoupling enabled here, and for the moment what I've done is the P0 to P3 lines are wired into the CRTC output and what that means is it'll just give us a sort of a test pattern on the screen when we hook up the video output from here and although it's a little bit difficult to see what we've also got is 75 ohm 1% uh, 75 ohm resistors are tying the outputs of the video output here for red green blue to to ground so that gives us our 75 ohm impedance and at the moment, the output lines are just, just up here whilst we just check things out. As I was developing this, I was, I was checking to see that the um, the current that was feeding into there was the right sort of range and that the voltage output was correct. However, whenever you're measuring the voltage output for video um, cards, you do need to take into account the fact that you need a 75 ohm impedance on the meter that you're, you're testing it with to get the correct voltage. But it largely seemed to work okay. And what we're going to be doing is to program the color palette first of all. And once we've programmed the color palette, then we'll try and hook it up to the uh, to the red, green, blue outputs. So you can see here that the current uh, digital analog converter is very simple. It's just a, a resistor array of about uh, three res resistors for each of the uh, red green blue values and then there's an intensity as well that gives it sort of a bright thing and then this is the red green blue outputs so once we've got our video DAC uh, working what we should be able to do is to swap out this bit of circuit and we actually have the red green blue and intensity signals coming from below the board here coming into here and if we actually patch our video DAC into there we should be able to actually drive the monitor output there and check to see that we get the same output. So what I'm going to do first of all is just to run up uh, the NanoComp and to run one of the test programs that I run previously for the character mode test just to show the default colors that we've got and then we'll look at programming the video DAC palette initialization, uh, run it up and then wire it in to see whether or not we can reproduce the same color output that we had from the resistor array. Okay, so this is the default character mode startup screen from the Nanocomp where we left it last time. And all I'm going to do now is just to run one of the basic character test programs. And what this will do is also output the colors down the bottom here. So at the moment, with our very simple video DAC using a resistor array, we get 16 values going from black to white. And the way how this works is red, green, blue plus intensity. I think the intensity is on the lowest bit and then it goes, so I think it's in kind of almost reverse order. So it goes intensity, blue, green, red, I think in the um, sequence. So what I'm going to try and do then is just to make sure that our color palette gets initialized with similar uh, values as this so that when we plug this in, we can see whether or not it's actually reproducing the same thing we want. So let's have a look at the code. So the crux of where all this comes from is we need an array of 256 red, green, blue combinations. And there is a utility program that I was able to find. I'll include the URLs in the description, which will generate the output of the default VGA color palette. Now what I have done here is the first 16 values I have customized to match the existing Nanocomp color palette that we showed you in the test screen previously. But once we've um, completed that and got it all up and running, I'll set it back to the default VGA palette. So this, um, I modified the program that, that I downloaded to generate these uh, triple triplets, red, green, blue, combinations. I've then also modified it on the standard nanocomp library, which is common library that's being used for the other two games, and I will be adding this into the monitor. So the palette initialization that basically goes through that array that I've defined and sends out the palette address right for the 
palette entry that it wants the address it wants, then outputs the red, green, blue values, and then prints out a diagnostic message as well. So there's an initialization routine, and then I've also got a test routine. And what this does in the early stages of doing this, I was using this to work out why things weren't working. In the early stages, I managed to swap the the two address lines around so that they were reversed and um, this caused some confusion but uh, I've got to the bottom of that. So this uh, palette test basically makes sure that the values that we've written to it are actually being returned and then the C program that actually calls this enables the debugging on the serial port and initializes the palette and then runs a palette test. So it's a very simple test program, but what this should allow us to do is to enable the, the video DAC to actually have some sensible values in there so that we can actually see if it's working or not. So I'm just going to compile that. So this is compiling it in Ubuntu. So that's generated the SREC file that we need. So if we just have a quick look at the SREC file, so you can see it starts at 000, and you can see there's a, it's a reasonable size because it has the color palette embedded in it as well. So we're just going to download that and run it in the nanocomp. And then what I'll be doing is running the, the logic analyzer just to make sure that we can see everything is being processed properly. So we're at the logic analyzer here. I'm just going to load this program down into nanocomp and run it. Okay, so I've sent the file down to the nanocomp, it's ready to run, and I'm just going to start my logic analyzer. So what I'm doing here is looking at the data going into video DAC. We've also got the E read write signal, CRTC, Y3 signal, and the read and write enable signals here. So this is going to be triggered on when we first access the Y3 address enable for the video DAC. So we'll just kick that off there. And now I'm just going to run up the test program. I've actually enabled the output capture of that as well. So you should be able to see the logging messages that it's output as we've gone. So the program's finished. It's just finishing collecting the data. So what you can see here, that we've, we've collected quite a lot of data. If we just drill down to the beginning here, we can see that what's going on here is Where we have our E signal, there's read write. This is going low, which means write. We can see here that we've got our uh, CRTC Y3 address signal. So that's the address that we had identified for the video DAC. And you can see here that with our PLDs programming rules, that we're actually getting a write enable signal, which looks about the right place. Then if we have a look here, I think this should be writing the 0, 0. So this will be writing palette entry 0. And then I think the first palette uh, three colors are 0, 0, 0. So the, this is black. So that's black. And then if we go to the next one, what we should find here is probably palette entry 1. Yep. So we've got 1 there. And then should be values here. So this is 1F in fact. So 1F I think is used for dark grey. So it would be 1F, 1F, 1F. So it looks like that's working okay. You can see there that we've got the decoded read and write signals and a lot later on um, I think we should have enough here. Yeah, if we go into this bit here you'll see that this is where the test program is actually reading all the values. So you can see here that it's writing the address. So that was uh, the address palette for six zero. And then this will be the first. This will be the red value. So that was 2D, 3F. So you can see that the palette values here are a bit more varied. And this is because this is the default VGA palette. All the values above uh, palette entry 16 will be default VGA palette. So that looks like it's worked okay. So what I'm going to do now is to look at 
plugging in the outputs for this to replace the video outputs from the existing DAC. Okay, so all I'm going to do is just going to turn off the nano comp because I don't want to do this whilst it's running. So I'm just going to take out the red, plug in the red line. That's red. Green, plug in green. Now to start with, this is just going to be driving the palette selection lines are going to be driven from some of the address outputs which are on the CRTC chip which I've used in some of the earlier videos for just generating a test pattern. So all we've done is we've replaced the output from the legacy digital analog converter for the video and we've plugged it into over here and because the leads here are going into the CRTC here, these values will be cycling so we should get some sort of test pattern just to show the different values. Okay so I'm just going to restart Nanocomp, load the test program again and then we're going to go to the screen share. So you can see that we've already got some sort of test pattern there and what I'm going to do now is to run the... there we go. So what we've got here we can see at the top here that we start with black, dark grey, blue, lighter blue, dark green, light green, dark cyan, cyan, a dark red, a lighter red stroke orange, I think in the original nanocomp it was, dark, darker purple and lighter purple and then a dark yellow, light yellow and then a dark, a light grey and white. The colours on the video capture card aren't quite as uh, same as the, um, the monitor but um, it, it's pretty close. So that appears to be generating an output. It's only doing it for the first 16 palette entries because that's all I've hooked up. What I'm going to do now is to look at wiring in the inputs to the current digital analog converter and see whether or not we can run up our test program to see whether or not we can get the same colours on our basic character test program. So we're just going to unwire the inputs to the video DAC from the CRTC address lines. Now the least significant bit is actually the intensity, so we're going to plug that in there. The orange one is not used, so we just need to ground. We just need to ground that. Then it goes blue, I think, goes to this one. Green then goes to black. And then red goes, in fact, to red. Okay. Oops. That should be okay. So when we go, um, we just need to run up the test program again because we need to keep on initializing the video DAC each time we power things on. What I will do is to add that to the monitor ROM so it does it automatically at power on. But for the moment, we have to do that each time. So I'm just going to run up that test program again. And then what that should mean is that when things restart, then we should actually be able to see what's going on. In actual fact, we get it coming up in black and white. So the default initialization of the video DAC at least provides us with sufficient to give us black and white, which is good. What I'm just going to do now is to load the test program. So this is going to initialize the video DAC to make sure the palette entries and things are populated. So I'll just do that. Okay, that's not quite what we expect. We expect that to be blue. So I'll just have a look at that in a bit. And now I'm just going to load the other test program, which is the one I showed you at the beginning, just to see what we get there. So, okay, so we'd expect that to be blue. So it looks like one of the signals isn't quite plugged in properly. So I'm just going to have a look at that and we'll rerun it. Okay, well, I had a look at the wiring. I uh, just hadn't quite plugged in one or two of the wires quite properly. So what I'm going to do now is to, you can see it's powered up and it's come up in the white on blue by default. So it's interpreting the colors correctly. So if you just run the test program and you can see now the colors down the bottom here are very similar to what we had previously. So we've got white, light gray, yellow, dark yellow, sort of pink, purple. The orange might need a little bit of work dark red is 08 so and we can see I think perhaps the blue 
colours are not quite uh, coming out as we want so we might need to look at the blues to see if we can get those to uh, to have slightly different values but looks like the video DAC is being able to provide the same colours that we had for the first 16 colours that we had previously so that appears to be working so what we're going to do now is to look at swapping out the old digital analog converter on the board and we will then start to fit in the new chips and program the PLD so we can have the character mode working as it is with the screen as you see it there and then it will also enable the high res graphics mode and the high color graphics modes as well. Okay so what we can see here is this is where we've um, been testing our digital analog converter the VGA digital analog converter and we've managed to wire this in and at least make sure it's working so I'm pretty sure that the basic control signals are working and what we're going to need to do now is to take out our original buffer chip there and replace it with the video DAC and we're also going to need to switch out this multiplexer here there's some extra logic that we need to do the PLD that we've got up here will probably need to be located down the bottom of the board somewhere and then there's another latch we need to add down here which is going to feed the video RAM 1 chip 8 bits into the multiplexer up here as well. So what I'm going to do is to have a look at the KiCad diagram. We'll just explain what's going on there. So here's the KiCad diagram. I've now updated it and basically what we're having to do here is the video DAC chip, which is this one here. We're also then replacing the current sort of multiplexer with this PLD multiplexer and this is what determines whether or not we feed in the 8 bits of 256 colour or whether we take the lower 4 bits or the upper 4 bits the foreground and background colours when we're doing the lower colour graphics and when we're doing character based so what this multiplexer does is if it's on graphics mode 3 so that's the high res color we take all c0 to c7 just go straight through out to the other side and if we're in the other graphics mode or the character mode then depending on the foreground and background value then we either take c0 to c3 and feed that out to p0 to p3 or we take c4 to c7 so that basically means we either take the foreground color or the background color and we only use the first 16 colors in the color palette over here can also see that we've got our constant current source here and there's also the 75 ohm uh, resistors that we need for the output impedance and this is probably the most complicated bit of logic I've had to do here so this PLD that we started with just for doing the read and write signals has now been expanded to do a lot of the other control signals that we need and I'll go through and explain what what these things at a high level are in a minute and then finally down the bottom there is a new latch here and what this does is takes the video RAM output here and when we are in graphics um, mode it will then send the output of there up to the multiplexer here and you can see that this video chip RAM chip 2 already has a feed that actually sends the output from it up to here so this particular latch here we already have in place although what we are going to need to do is to modify the control logic here such that it's able to do the the new video mode as well as the character mode and the high res graphics mode so if we just look at the latches that we need for this so what I've done here is for each of the video RAM, so graphics RAM 1 or the character RAM, so this in the character mode determines which is the character value that we're going to show on the screen. And we can see here that these are the various latches that we have. So there's U3, U37 and U34. Now these first two here uh, are no different so we don't need to change anything to do that. And this new one is the one that we've added down the bottom and we want this to only be enabled when we're in graphics mode 3, so high colour graphics. The output enable is going to be based similar to what we've got in some of the other enables here, but the difference is, is that this one is enabled for graphics mode 3, this was for graphics mode 2, and then 
it's a little bit more complicated for the clock signal for this one because rather than clocking this once per character we actually need this to do four triggers per character clock cycle. In order to look at this let's have a quick look at the Excel sheet that I've been doing the timing. So if we just have a look at the Excel sheet with this information in. So this is a timing diagram based on the dot clock QA, QB and QC signals that we have as part of the character clock timing and these are the two formula down here for the character latch and the shift register latch. You can see that basically in our clock cycle that the character latch occurs on about the third clock cycle out of seven. So this is the 25 megahertz clock cycle. For each character there are eight dot clock cycles and then the SR latch you can see occurs on about um, clock cycle five. High res colour graphics what we need is we actually need four clock cycles per character. So that means that we need for these pixels here so we've got a red green blue and yellow pixel being shown here and each of these will last for two clock cycles so you can see there's clock zero clock one clock two clock three and by working through all these combinations in order to actually get some sort of latch signal and i'm assuming that we need to do that around this point here then what we're going to do is to take the uh, inverse of the dot clock and then and that with the QA signal and that should give us a zero signal here. Now the latches are triggered when they go from zero to one. So the latch would actually be triggered at this edge here where it goes from zero up to one. And if we did find that we needed to do it a little bit later in the cycle, then obviously we could change the formula to do the triggering a little bit later in the cycle. But I think this should be early enough for us to do this. We have to allow the video RAM to actually find the data. So this first period here is about half a clock cycle, so 20 nanoseconds. So hopefully come the end of this stage here it's about 40 nanoseconds the address on the video ram should have actually returned the data we want so at this point here we should have the data if we find out we don't have it and we have um, problems with it then we might be able to shift it further along in the clock cycle by changing the formula but basically this means that by taking the dot clock and the QA signal we should be able to generate the latch signals that we need for the high color graphics. So this is where this um, formula has come down here is the block that we need the PLD for the DAC generate the right signals. Then if we look at the other graphics RAM, so this is graphics RAM 2, the color RAM. Now the color RAM is used already quite a bit and you can see here that the U2 is the color latch and in the character mode then basically the output's always enabled and there is this latch clock that we've just covered in the previous Excel. The high res graphics we don't need any change the output enable has this formula here and it's actually latched on our uh, Y3 color latch. This means we set the foreground and background colors basically by writing to the color latch uh, for this particular mode. This is our the existing shift register latch. So this basically takes the graphics output and sends it to the shift register. That isn't going to change. And then this is the new mode. So for our graphics to video RAM 256 color, we actually need this to be added to the existing configuration. So we need to have a very similar output enable is going to be similar to above apart from it's rather than graphics mode two, we've now got graphics mode three, and we see here that the latch clock is very similar. So what that means is that the signals which are currently coming out of one of the original video PLDs for controlling this particular latch now need to have a combination of, of all of these first, second and third. So these are the rules that we've got down here and this is why this has taken me quite a long time to work this out. It wasn't particularly straightforward to work out but what this basically means is that we've got a new output enable for the video RAM 2 and this includes the graphics mode, mode 2 high res graphics and the high color graphics and this should in a, mean the output enable is enabled when it's needed and then it also accommodates the different latch signals so in graphics mode one it's just using the character latch in graphics mode two it uses this special color latch that we use for setting the foreground background colors and then in our graphics mode three which is our high color we've now got this four latches per clock cycle 
coming from this calculation here. So this has been really, really complicated to work out. Just show you the rules for the PLDs for this. So first of all, we've got the video multiplexer. So this is the thing that takes the eight bits of color value, whether it be four bits of foreground and four bit, bits of background. And then based on the foreground background color, it will then output either C0 to C3 or C4 to C7. I think C4 to C7, I think is the foreground. And if we look down here, you can see, yes. So C0 to C3 is intensity, blue, green, red background. And then the C4 to C7 is foreground. And then when we're in graphics mode three, then all eight bits are passed through to P0 to P7. But when graphics mode three value is zero, then we're just taking either the, the lower four bits, the upper four bits, depending on the foreground background there. I can see here, this is the rules that we've got here for doing that. So for P0 to P3, you can see, depending on the foreground and background value, we're mapping C0 to C3 or C4 to C7. And then for the C4 to C7, they're only mapped for graphics mode three. So that's the video multiplexer. So needed to use a PLD for this, just because this to do this with 7.4 LS logic chips would have required quite a few, and it's much easier to do using a PLD. The DAC, Digital Analog Converter, PLD that we had previously, this was used initially just to do the graphics mode and the read and write signals, but this has now been extended quite a bit to cover all the other signals. So those slides that I showed you previously, this now includes all the pins that it needs. So we've got the two graphics modes. We've got an output that indicates it's in graphics mode three. Read, write. We've got the Y3 color latch, which graphics mode two requires. That's the high res. We've got the dot clock. We've got the inverted Y0 clock. So that's the video RAM enable. We've got the character latch. We've got QA, E, and we've also got the memory address 12 from the CRTC. And then these are the outputs. So the read and write for the VGA palette. And then these are the revised output enable and latch enables, which now combine uh, the multiple values that we need. So you can see down here at the bottom that some of these now combine graphics mode zero, two, and three, and that the latch signal now includes the different latch signals that we need from, from those slides. So that's why it's taken me a little bit longer than normal to do this video, because work all this lot out was, uh, was quite tricky. So what I'm going to do now is to start replacing the current chips with the new ones. And I'm going to tick these off in the schematic diagram here. So I'm going to start with replacing this one and the current source. And that should enable us to plug in some of the pins coming from the current chip here. We're then going to replace this chip and going to need to put this chip in. And then finally, we will wire in this other latch down the bottom. Now, although this diagram has got this chip up here, I think that there's not going to be enough space on the board. So I'm going to need to put that a bit lower down the board. So it's going to mean there's going to be wires trailing around a bit, but I uh, don't think that can be helped. Given the way we've developed this uh, project incrementally, I might uh, have a go at sort of rebuilding this at some later stage and we can space things out a bit better. Okay, so let's start by unplugging as many of these wires as we can first. So unplug the control signals, all of the feeds from the address lines, giving our test pattern. This is our video DAC. And this is the old PLD that we don't need anymore because we've done a new one. So these are the new chips, their chip labels on. So we've got the multiplexer, which is going to go here. We've got the new control chip, which I think is going to probably have to go down here somewhere, all the way down the bottom. And then this is the new latch, which is going to go just down the bottom below the current latches there. So what I'm going to do now is to unplug this chip and all the associated resistor digital analog converter here. Probably need to move some of this stuff around so we've got a bit more space. We're going to remove the multiplexer out and wire in the various things to the to the new PLD multiplexer. Then we're going to put in the latch down there and probably right down the bottom, right down the bottom here, we will put the new control PLD. It's not ideal, but I don't think there's anywhere else to put it at the moment. 
Okay, so we're going to take the chips out. I'm going to take out that breadboard buddy just so you've got a bit more space at the top there. And I'll just move some of those out of the way for the moment. Undo some of the wires and things that were going to the previous digital analog converter. Taking out the old resistors from the DAC and some of the output resistors there. So put in the video DAC, put in the power supply lines. Check everything out. So now we're going to put in the 75 ohm output impedance resistors, wire in the, the red, green and blue outputs from the video DAC. Now we also need to put in the constant current source. So this is the LM332, two resistors and a diode. I we just need to make sure the feed into the IRF is the right length. Just fix that. Just moved it down a little bit to give us a bit more space. I was taking another look at the board here and we're trying to fit the multiplexer in here. We also need to fit in our blood controller chip here to do all the control signals. I don't really want to put it down the bottom of the board because then the clock signal is going to be going, the 40 megahertz, 25 megahertz clock signal is going to be going way too far. So what I was thinking, I'm just going to move this up about seven holes and that should just give enough space for the two chips to go in here. So I'm going to need to rewire all this stuff here, but I think that makes it a lot uh, neater and I can have the two new chips I need up here, which is where I need them to be. Let's just move the VGA connector up seven holes and we're going to shuffle up all the other wires as well, along with it. Various resistors, the feed from the horizontal and vertical sink. There are quite a lot of ground lines up there and uh, because we don't have a lot of ground rail access there we just need to wire some of these together just to make sure the ground is available. So I'm just putting in the red, green, blue signals there just so I've got a reference and we're going to need to cut these 75 ohm wires a little bit short and put the outputs from the red, green, blue there. So we've uh, shortened those resistors and now the output from the video DAC is a little bit cleaner. And then we just need to wire in the red, green, blue outputs from there into the VGA connector. So now we're going to put in the PLD and we put in the new multiplexer, wire in the power for those. Now we're going to put in some decoupling capacitors and some tantalium capacitors there. You've got to be very careful to put them in the right polarity or they blow up. You certainly have smoke come out of them if you put them in the wrong way, as I've found. We'll check off the schematic, just make sure the wires are in there. They weren't quite right, I think. So we're going to check off on the schematic to make sure I've got all the pins done properly. So now we're wiring in the output for the foreground background for the multiplexer. We also need to run the uh, graphics mode 3 output into there as well. And then we're going to wire the, the read and write enable signals going to the video DAC coming from the PLD there. And these are the address lines coming from the PIA. And this is a problem I had because the original PIA had the address lines a0 and A1 the wrong way around, then at the moment they're the, the wrong way around as well. So the real address line A0 is going to RS1 and A1 is going to RS0, and that's one of the issues I had to sort out later. You see here we're now wiring up the the address the data lines using those cables. Now we're wiring in the new latch down the bottom, which feeds the 256 color output from the video RAM 1. So we need to wire in the data connections from the other latch. So this is the D0 to D1 coming from the video RAM. 
it's just sort of uh, brought down from above there. So we'll check those off. We just need to make sure we get the control signals right. So again, we're using another one of these uh, ribbon cable connectors. Now this is going to be the tricky bit in that there are a lot of different signals coming from all over the place and this is going to be a bit messy. There's going to be uh, leads going all over the place. If I redesign this board, I'll probably combine some of these PLDs into a big 40 pin chip. will make things a bit cleaner. But for the moment, I'll just have these wires going around the place. So it's a little bit messy at the moment, bringing all the various signals from the different uh, PLDs and different uh, control signals. As you can see there, we've got the dot clock coming from the 25 megahertz VGA crystal. So the dot clock is going to be going into there on the video DAC. We're also making sure the various latch signals are going into the right place as well. And some of these signals are now replaced by uh, an output coming out of the new PLD. So it's combining multiple outputs from the original PLD and now combining it with some of our graphics mode 3 stuff. That's feeding the, I think, the E clock signal over here. So we'll just check off all those things. We've got the read and write. And we just need to make sure the output enables for those things are done properly. So we're taking the output from the PLD and feeding it down to the new latch. Just checking the latch signal for that one. The first one we did was the output enable. Now it's the latch signal. They're just checking all those make sense. Now we need to feed the chip enable line for the video DAC from our CRTC address decoding down the bottom there. I'm just about to finish off uh, wiring up the last uh, number of wires here and I'll just share a tip that Dave shared with me on uh, video 8 of the video controller series. He basically suggested getting, rather than having the sort of individual connectors on DuPont cables like this, um, to actually buy the sort of uh, housing, crimp housing, eight-way crimp housing. Basically what we can do is to take these individual ones off and then plug the wires into here and it makes it a lot easier to hook up these eight-way uh, wires like this so that we can do it from one chip to the other much more easily. So I'm just going to do that and then I'm going to plug in the final jumper here between two of the latches that I need and then we're going to see if we can fire up this uh, video card and see if we can get it working high colour mode. Small screwdriver and then for each one of these we just need to prise up the little um, little plastic tab there and once we've prized it up sufficiently okay once we prise it up it just comes off and we're just left with the pin like that once you've done it for all of these then all we've got to do is to work out how to plug this in here and basically we just need to make sure that this is going in the same side as where the clip is there so I'm just going to do the others here and then we'll put it together Okay, so I've taken all the individual connectors off this one here. Now we're going to do is to line this up with the connector here. And we just need to make sure all these are going in the right way around and they don't get twisted. A little bit fiddly to do this. It'll be easier to come in at an angle. There we go. So we've got them in the same colour sequence that we're using for the logic probes. And when this is like that, all we need to do then is just to push it down a little bit until they click. Sometimes we might need to pull them through a little bit if it's a little bit sticky, but you can see there, managed to get them all coming through. And then if we get 
our small pliers can just pull them through to make sure they go. There we go. And you just hear a little click each time each one is located. So be careful not to squeeze too tightly on here, otherwise you'll squish the, the pins come out of shape. There you go. So now all those and then that means that now our eight-way cable is dead easy to plug in and I'm just going to do the other end now as well. Okay so here's the other end I've prepared them all and now we just need to push them in make sure they go in straight and then we can just pull them through if they haven't clipped clicked there we go it's all done so now we have a nice eight-way cable using our standard color scheme with I think purple as pin one and that makes it that easy to hook these up. So thanks Dave for the tip. So I'll just plug that in between the output of the latch there and the input to the multi. Okay, so we've completed the build of the 256 color graphics option on this uh, breadboard video controller. And I'm gonna break the video now because uh, the testing is gonna take a little bit longer. And in the next video, what I'm going to be doing is looking at the Doom startup logo image and looking at how we can transfer that down into the nanocomp and testing out the display of that and hopefully getting to the end of the video controller project so if you don't want to miss out on future videos please hit subscribe and if you found the content interesting and useful please hit like thanks for watching